You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 10, 2015, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, non-IgE-mediated food allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Matthew Greenhot. He's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from uh, beautiful downtown Kansas City where the temperature is hot and humid. <laughs> We're getting ready for ragweed season. Are we seeing any, any ragweed in the yeah, air? Yeah, we've gotten up maybe five or so. I, we probably still haven't gotten 1% of the total pollen we're going to see in the season, but we've seen a few. Yeah, the official starting day of ragweed uh, season is August 15th. That's when we have our little celebration, but I think it's going to be really good, um, over time as good with climate change and all of that and the CO2 levels. Um, but um, our talk, we're now going to switch gears and instead of talking about ragweed, we're going to talk about food allergies. And we're now joined by Dr. Matt Greenhot. Uh, Dr. Greenhot is an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm an alumnus of that program myself. Somewhere in the uh, on the wall in the, at the University of Michigan is a picture of all of the former fellows, and I'm, I'm one of those pictures. I don't know if I am even recognizable by my picture from that uh, period of time. Mm -hmm. At any rate, Dr. Greenhot is a, uh, an expert in, in food allergy, and he's my go-to person for non-IgE-mediated food reactions, such as uppies and, and eosinophilic esophagitis and so on. Um, has a lot of uh, novel and interesting ideas about food allergy. He's kind of an out-of-the-box thinker, so we're really glad to have uh, Dr. Greenhot talking with us today about non-IgE-mediated food allergies. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Greenhot. Thank you. All right, just want to make sure everybody can see this. Um, <clears throat> I didn't let go. Perfect. Uh, all right, I'm trying to... Oh, i got to find the... All right, there we go. Um, I have a number of disclosures. Um, some of which might be relevant for today. Um, I, I, I am a, a senior author on an upcoming FPIES practice parameter, or sorry, a, a, a practice guideline, and I have uh, lectured for Nutricia on, uh, on FPIES, which I'll be doing actually tomorrow um, as well. Um, but everything that I say here is based on my own opinions and beliefs uh, and understandings of the medical literature and not reflective of any of my uh, past, present, or will be future employers, uh, NIH, or any other research sponsors. So with that, when we talk about food allergy, the nomenclature and the classification are very, very important. Um, in, in general, can you see the arrow? Yes. Okay. In general, when we talk about food allergies, you know, you have to go up to a higher level classification, so the adverse reaction, so anything bad that happens after you eat something, and that might be non-immune mediated, and we're all familiar with these things, the person who gets bloating, gas, and diarrhea after uh, drinking milk who no longer makes uh, lactase, um, people who get a headache or jittery after drinking caffeine or eating uh, processed meats, which is a pharmacologic reaction, the person who eats spoiled fish and actually can, can have a histamine release in the body, uh, or other things that happen. All of these are non-immune mediated. When, what we concentrate on is especially um, is the immune mediated. Now, we, we still have to sort of tease out the left side of this from the right side of this as part of our jobs, but where we can key in and help and offer people um, therapies, treatments, potentially, uh, or higher order diagnosis is on this, this left side here. Um, and, and what we're talking about today is not the IgE mediated, but this category here, this non-IgE mediated. Um, and it's a weird place to be because we don't really have diagnostic tests for it. Um, we do for celiac disease, but really for nothing else. Um, for IgE mediated, you just heard a whole lecture on, on, on that, very eloquently spoken by Dr. Oppenheimer. Um, <clears throat> but for the non-IgE mediated folks, this, this becomes a little bit more of a, of a a clinical history and you really have to sort of understand the process and how to elicit the, the right history to make the right diagnosis. So what is non-IG mediated food allergy? Well, <clears throat> obviously it doesn't involve the antibody. Um, it involves sometimes 
um, other processes, we think cellular mediated processes, it's, it's far less understood than IG mediated food allergy and in general is, is classified by having negative specific IgE but also a, a positive challenge or, or provocation. And there are three main categories. Um, there are GI symptoms, so you can have celiac disease, you can have eosinophilic esophagitis, F pies, enteropathy, and proctocolitis. In skin, you can have atopic dermatitis, dermatitis herpetiformis, and in respiratory, you can have Heiner syndrome. And these can be triggered by a whole variety of, 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 of different foods, um, but you'll hear that it, it tends to be triggered by a couple of common ones, just like IG mediated food allergy. And the types of things that we're going to discuss today, eosinophilic esophagitis is a, a whole lecture unto itself, so I'm going to concentrate on some of the other ones. And actually, most of the talk is on FPIs, but we'll talk about the enteropathies, the proctocolitis, a little bit about celiac disease um, and Heiner syndrome, just because these are things that you may get asked about on the boards, or more importantly, um, you might actually be consulted on a case or it walks into your office. So dietary protein enteropathy. Um, this is an old diagnosis, something that's been seen since about the turn of the, the 20th century. Uh, and mainly what you see are diarrhea, emesis, failure to thrive that used to be primarily attributable to cow milk but has been seen also with soy, wheat, and egg. And for whatever reason, there was a cluster in Finland in the mid-1960s, and we don't see a lot of this anymore. At least maybe allergists don't see a lot of this anymore. This, this may be something that gastroenterology sees and we don't see so much. In general, this presents within the first nine months of life. You can get protracted diarrhea within about a month to two months of steady cow milk introduction. And really what you see is a malabsorption type syndrome. There's malabsorption, there's steatorrhea, there's bloating and fullness, as well as vomiting and a progressive failure to thrive. The onset can be very gradual or it can be sudden and there have been some descriptions that there might be a, a, an acute gastroenteritis prodrome with this. Um, what's nice is that once you figure out what this is and you remove the, the target allergen, the symptoms tend to resolve. Um, you may see milk specific IgA and IgG precipitating antibodies but generally will not see IgE. There might be some HLA-DR association as well. Some of the secondary effects like you see in a lot of malabsorption uh, is, is anemia, low protein, low fat soluble vitamins, um, and you can see lingering tissue damage in the jejunum for up to possibly two years. Um, when there is a biopsy uh, and it's stained for, you can see mast cell activation, eosinophil activation, intraepithelial lymphocytes, apoptosis. Um, Generally not something that we see very often, but it's a good parallel to sort of what, what is seen in, um, in celiac disease, which is a very specific type of protein enteropathy that we'll talk about in a second. The thing that you will see a lot, and actually in general pediatrics or in family medicine, any primary care will see a lot, is dietary protein proctocolitis. This is mislabeled as milk protein allergy. It's really not an allergy per se as it is sort of a... Um, an irritation of the GI tract, um, but you get rectal bleeding with or without mucus and otherwise healthy babies um, triggered by milk primarily but also triggered in, in, in a number of cases by soy. And these are generally very healthy breastfed babies that have no failure to thrive or anything else but um, usually just team positive stool. And it's usually either streaked within or for whatever reason um, it, it, it's caught on a guaiac or whatnot. Um, it generally removes very promptly, I mean it resolves very promptly with allergen removal from um, definitely from the child's diet, but also it tends to respond um, to maternal diet changes. Uh, it very rarely progresses beyond this sort of, you know, uh, asymptomatic uh, heme positive stool. In very severe cases there has been reports of anemia and hypoalbuminemia. Um, there may be a role of passive sensitization through breast milk with beta lactoglobulin. In general this is the one diagnosis where I will suggest to a nursing mom to possibly change her diet. I generally don't do that and those who know me and have heard me lecture on other things, um, I'm pretty notorious for saying that, that that's a good way to not only alienate the mother but to make her very, very unhappy and possibly um, you know, compromise her nutrition. When you start to ask the mom to change things, I know we do this in IG mediated food allergy with eczema with other things, um, this is the one case where it's probably the most substantiated and for whatever reason it, it, it does resolve. Um, in general, with these babies, this is a clinical diagnosis. It needs to be confirmed by elimination, and you really should follow up with another guaiac after you've eliminated the allergen to make sure that the um, that the blood has gone away. 
Um, it's not enough just to remove the, the allergen from the, the baby's diet and sort of see them back in a couple of months. You know, you want to make sure that this is going away because there is a wide, a, a sort of a wide differential that could include um, FPIs, enteropathy, fissures, intersusceptions, lots of things that can cause sort of um, a little bit of GI bleeding that's reflected in the stool. Um, most of these kids don't have food-specific IgE. I virtually never test in, in, in this diagnosis, when it, and it's usually pretty obvious what it is. Um, in terms of the pathology, you can see some mucosal edema in the distal colon, maybe some eosinophilia, um, possibly um, peripheral eosinophilia, and overall just markers of ATP, like you know, general increased Ig and maybe a family history. These children generally tolerate tolerate hydrolyzed formula. Um, there are a handful that need a complete amino acid based formula. Um, you could switch them to soy, but you should test to make sure that soy is not also a trigger because there is an appreciable rate. The nice thing about this diagnosis is that almost all cases resolve by age one and they go on to a normal dietary progression without any other sequela. Um, <clears throat> when there are sort of visualization of the tissue, um, again you can see sort of erythematous friable mucosa um, and you can see some lymphoid nodule hyperplasia at times. Most of the time you never get to this point. This is probably an incidental finding or, or this child was really, really sick and it was having extensive hemorrhaging. Um, normally, this is a clinical diagnosis. Celiac disease, so this is a gluten-induced autoimmune enteropathy. I will strongly advocate that this is not an allergist disease. This is a gastroenterologist disease. Um, but we need to be aware of it because you may be the only person in your community that can deal with such a thing. There might not be good access to a gastroenterologist or for whatever reason they've identified you as the food specialist and because this is triggered by a food, they'll come to you first and it'll be your job to sort of make the diagnosis or at least suspect the diagnosis and send them on. What you see are anti-gliadin, anti-endomesial, and anti-tissue transglutaminase, IgA. There's an association with HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. And this presents much like the enteropathy that we just talked about a couple of slides ago, weight loss, failure to thrive, steatorrhea, di diarrhea, but also extra intestinal manifestations. You can see oral ulcers. You can see abdominal pain. These are generally sick kids. Um, in the rare case of a kid presenting with failure to thrive as the only symptom, it might be more subtle. Um, but for the most part, for the kids that I've seen and that have been sent into our practice and, and we've sent them out, most of them have had a pretty characteristic uh, diarrheal illness associated with all of this. On biopsy, you can see villus atrophy and lymphocytic infiltration. Um, the trick is, is that these kids actually have to have gluten exposure at the time of diagnosis. So if they're off of gluten, and they don't have a normal IgA, you're going to have a very hard time making the diagnosis. And unfortunately, like eosinophilic esophagitis, this is a histologically made diagnosis, not necessarily serologic. I think the serology is fairly sensitive, but it's not specific, um, and it won't fly. They need to actually have pieces of tissue. Um, this resolves with removal of gluten. Um, this is not the time or place to get into sort of the subtle differences between gluten and wheat, but I would encourage you to go look that up. You see a lot of people sort of talk about gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance. This is absolutely and unequivocally not a gluten sensitivity or intolerance. This is an autoimmune mediated process triggered by gluten. Um, gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance is a whole different issue that probably borders more on that right side of that diagram that I showed earlier. Um, and again, I would raise the debate if this is really something that an allergist uh, should be dealing with versus a gastroenterologist. Um, it's probably good uh, to know about this because you might get a referral for this and it, it very well may appear on your boards. Dermatitis herpetiformis is something that, that every allergist should know about because this is a rash that can mimic atopic dermatitis, but it's, it's a result of, um, of a gluten-mediated enteropathy um, associated with celiac disease. You see a blistering papulovesicular symmetrical rash on the extensor surfaces, buttocks, and scalp. Again, it can look like atopic dermatitis, but atopic dermatitis would tend to be flexural as opposed to um, uh, extensor, at least by the textbook. Um, and in this, when there is a skin biopsy, you see IgA deposits at the dermal epidermal junction. Um, again, typically associated with celiac disease and you have um, elevated serologies. Um, and there may be actually asymptomatic GI damage ongoing at the time of this rash. Um, this again is something that responds to removal of gluten from the diet, but Dapsone can also help with the rash. Um, but again, it's one of these mimicking things. So if you're having somebody who you're treating for very stubborn eczema who might be having some possible wheat symptoms, uh, this is something to consider. 
Uh, this is a nice pictorial of what the rash can look like. That to me looks more like measles or chicken pox to me, but um, <clears throat> this is what came up in the, uh, in, in the best picture I could find for it. But again, you can see this on the extensor surfaces here um, and fairly symmetrical. Heiner syndrome. This is probably something you are unlikely to encounter in your career, but it's something you should know about. This is milk-induced pulmonary hemosiderosis. It's been reported with egg as well. You can sometimes see anemia, failure to thrive, rectal bleeding, and lower respiratory symptoms with hemoptysis. Um, and generally, you see a bilateral pulmonary infiltrate with hyaluronopathy. Um, this is directed, this is IgG against milk. And there's, episode, uh, there's evidence of precipitating antibodies. It's not quite sure why this happens. The antibodies are not necessarily pathognomonic. Again, we make IgG antibodies against a lot of things, and we, uh, as a field, have not done a good job as sort of ascribing a value to what those actually mean. Um, sometimes uh, what you can, you, this is mainly, the cases that I've seen have been kids that were introduced to milk a little bit earlier than would be recommended, and they drink a heavy, heavy burden of milk where ordinarily these kids would be drinking formula. And they've come in massively anemic and, and coughing, and they've had infiltrates. Um, and when, when they've had a BAL, um, you can see hemosiderin-laden uh, macrophages, which is the pathognomonic uh, finding for it. Um, this is the pulmonary hemosiderosis. Um, there's some concern that this could be a result of aspiration or reflux, which is why they're, they're getting the, um, the, the BAL. Um, these kids sometimes have milk-specific IgE that's elevated, elevated total IgE, and you might have lymphocytic proliferation to milk. I'm not even sure how often these types of tests are, not, are, are done these days. Um, I think this is something that was done long ago, and now most of the testing related to food happens to be um, mainly IgE-based or maybe some of those ELISAs against IgG. This will slowly resolve with milk elimination, but these kids may need steroids. Um, pulmonary hemosiderosis can also be uh, attributable to stachybotrys. Um, this is the so-called black mold that came out of Cleveland in the late 80s. Um, again, this is something you're unlikely to see, but if you ever run into an x-ray that looks like this, where you can see sort of the fluffy infiltrates and the hyaluronopathy in this small kid, uh, and this is the pathognomonic finding of the hemosiderin-laden macrophages on um, <clears throat> on BAL um, that cinches the diagnosis. Jay, have you guys seen any cases there? I can't remember any. Do you remember well, any, Doug? Remember we had one stachybotrys case. We had a stachybotrys. Well, we had a hem pulmonary hemosiderosis that we were able to go to the home and find, you know, lots of stachybotrys. Yeah. yeah. Cause and effect, who knows. But just one, though. It's It's very uncommon. Yeah. So, all right, so now we're going to transition from sort of a quick survey of, of the other non-IG mediated diagnoses to the one that I think um, really you probably see a lot of and um, there's good evidence and growing evidence that um, actually allergists and, and primary care physicians are missing this diagnosis and this would be food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. So this is a gastrointestinal, pure gastrointestinal non-IG mediated food hypersensitivity. And it's got fairly characteristic findings. Delayed onset, generally profuse vomiting within two to four hours of eating characteristic foods, generally milk, soy, um, but also oat and rice. It comes on with um, dehydration, acidosis, and possible shock. Um, the way that I could describe this would be sort of exorcist-style vomiting. It's just protracted, and the kid keeps vomiting and vomiting and vomiting until they actually go into hypovolemic shock. And that brings on the dehydration and the acidosis, the lethargy, the ashen color, the pallor. Um, in some cases and in some phenotypes, there can be a bloody diarrhea that actually may be quite delayed. Um, this can look like a viral gastroenteritis, um, and it may occur pretty rapidly after a subsequent food exposure. Um, again, this is attributable to milk and soy as well as multiple solid foods, um, and it's something that I consider a medical emergency. The epidemiology, um, again, there's not a lot of research on FPIs. I think there's been more in the past couple of years than there has been, but very, very few large cohort studies, certainly not a lot of prospective stuff. Um, Dr. Itzhak Katz in Israel had a large birth cohort prospectively um, that found an estimated cumulative incidence over two years of 0.34% in Israeli, um, in Israeli uh, uh, 
and infants, um, but Israel is the only place that has prospective data. Everything else is sort of these clustered series coming from large referral centers where honestly there's there's probably no better place to go in, in, your, in your area. And a lot of these cases may escape detection if you're not near a large referral center. Um, if you're out sort of more rurally or in a state that doesn't have sort of a large program that dedicates a lot of time towards food allergy, these, these may just get handled by the gastro, either the gastroenterologist or um, maybe a local allergist or in most cases uh, primary care. It tends to affect more males than females. It tends to be a family history of atopic disorders and possibly even a family history of food allergy. In general, most of these cases will onset within the first year of life, generally around the time of infant weaning. Breastfed infants, because they're weaned a little bit later, tend to have a little bit more of a delayed uh, presentation. That's not because those kids are um, any different. It's just you're only introducing the foods, you know, six, seven, eight months later, as opposed to kids that are getting, you know, fed milk or soy formula right from from the get-go. This is a table from the upcoming. Uh, work group report from the academy that's just showing sort of the large cohorts. Um, again, you can see it goes back to first case report in, in the late 60s. Um, but if you look at these numbers, very, very small. So we're, we're dealing with probably less than three or probably, no, I would say even less than, than a thousand um, described cases in the literature, which is um, pretty small. Um, you know, and again, you can put all these studies on one table that fits on a PowerPoint slide. So um, I think there's lots of room to expand our knowledge base on this, but um, most of these, again, were, um, were retrospective, um, just a handful of, of prospective data. Um, and again, most of these clustered to large centers like CHOP or Mount Sinai. You know, this one's from Duke UNC. Um, you know, again, that, that might mean that in the community this presents a little bit differently. So what do you typically see? Um, most FPIs that we know of, the most common trigger is, is cow milk. Um, and it, short, it starts shortly after the, the child is introduced to cow milk, maybe not on the first feed, but the second, third, or fourth feed. Um, in Israel, all the babies uh, presented before six months and 73% presented before four months. Um, in Australia, the mean age of presentation was reported at 5.5 months, in Italy about 5.7 months, and in the UK, 8 months. In the US, the mean age was 9.7 in the large CHOP cohort, um, and 4 months in the Mount Sinai cohort. Again, a lot of this might not necessarily be when they first had the symptoms, but when they presented for care or whatnot. So, um, but again, it's, it's happening around the time of infant weaning for the most part. The breastfed babies seem to be protected by time, and they present when they wean. Um, you know, again, it's not that these babies are physiologically different. The food is just being introduced later in their diet um, than the other kids. Um, there have been a handful of case reports of breastfed babies developing uh, FPIs. Um, I think about four total. Um, we'll talk about breastfeeding and, and FPIs. Again, I don't think that this is a very common manifestation, although it is frequently reported that um, parents will, will see symptoms. Uh, it's just not well documented with literature reports. Solid food FPIs, because again, you wean um, these foods into the diet a little bit later, presents um, with slight delay compared to uh, soy or milk FPIs. Uh, very rare to present after the first year of life, but we are becoming aware of an increasing uh, number of adults who are reporting FPIs mainly to seafood. Um, including one prominent allergist whose identity I will uh, conceal is actually what we call sort of patient zero for adult FPIs um, and has a challenge proving case and, and that will be discussed in the, um, in, in the guidelines. Um, but it does happen in FPIs and you need to be a good detective and not sort of, um, not sort of think that this couldn't be happening. Again, this is a clinical diagnosis. There are no um, tests that you can do for FPIs unfortunately other than demonstrating this by doing a challenge in your office. Um, there are both acute and chronic forms. The acute form is much uh, better characterized. Again, this is sort of this repetitive onset of profuse vomiting leading to effects of uh, hypovolemia and acute phased reactants. Again, you see elevated neutrophils and thrombocytosis. Um, again, those are all uh, things that happen in, in, in the acute phase reaction. In Korea, they talk about elevated gastric juice leukocytes, but those need to be sort of caught within um, a very short time after the reaction occurs. There could be blood in the stool as well. Uh, the chronic form is something that we actually don't see a lot of in the U.S., or at least we don't have a consistent definition. Um, 
And, and the chronic form is something that, that it's not going to be well addressed in the upcoming guidelines at all, mainly because among about 30 authors, none of us could really come to much consensus on what we thought this should be uh, described as and what we thought we should do for it. Um, the definition is all over the place, and parents often have a definition of chronic FPIs that providers may not um, agree with, and that, that, that's one thing from experience that I've seen. But you see this intermittent chronic emesis and watery diarrhea with lethargy and dehydration um, and a failure to thrive. I think it was much more common uh, earlier on in the course of, of FPIs when this wasn't well recognized and these kids would be chronically exposed to the offending allergen over and over and over again. Um, and, and I don't think that that's very common anymore, although again, this certainly does happen and there's a very fervent core of people um, who are trying to better define um, chronic FPIs, uh, but it is a little bit of an enigma. Symptoms that you can see in acute FPIs, again, 75% will appear very acutely ill, 15% will have hypotension, and about a third will have acidosis or methemoglobinemia. Um, looking across the different countries where FPIs cases have been reported, you can see fairly consistent uh, large percentage will have vomiting, and then it falls off from there. Um, I think the next most common symptom is, is lethargy or pallor, probably related to, again, the profuse vomiting. Um, but in certain countries, you'll see more or less diarrhea or bloody stool than other places. Um, but again, I think, you know, vomiting, shock-like picture, diarrhea, lethargy, these are the common things that you, you tend to see in acute FPIs, and that, that, that seems to be well reflected across the globe. The age of onset is a little bit variable. Um, again, this is a slide coming from the upcoming uh, guidelines where you can see um, <clears throat> sort of variation depending on the food um, that, that was uh, in question that the age can float by uh, anywhere from one to five to seven to even 12 months. Other associated features with FPIs. So in general, these are going to be negative skin tests. Uh, this is not an IG-mediated phenomenon. Um, very, very few instances of finding sort of the dual um, positive skin test in the case of FPIs. When it is present, it tends to be associated with what they consider a more protracted course, and the challenges are a little bit more tricky, um, but, but these kids tend to hold on to this longer, and they may just switch phenotype from FPIs to IG-mediated food allergy. However, the vast majority are not going to have a positive skin test. Um, at diagnosis, I don't actually, uh, I, I personally don't um, obtain a skin test. Um, there's a recommendation in the upcoming guidelines that this is something that can be considered. I think it's a little bit more important at the time of challenge to see if there is a positive, um, <clears throat> if there is a positive skin test, and that that might change your, um, at least your your challenge protocol slightly. Um, a to B patch testing, the utility for this has varied. There was an early series of about 30-something kids from CHOP where they found that it was helpful. And there was a later larger series about three years ago published from Mount Sinai that didn't find it helpful. Uh, unfortunately, these are the only uh, two pieces of literature out there that are sort of telling you different things. So I would say at best the patch testing utility varies. And again, the predictive values of those are going to be all over the place. You're talking about very small numbers uh, to begin with. Um, and nothing sampled at a very robust level. It's going to make it very difficult to sort of predict what that would mean across the population. Serologic markers, during a, uh, during a reaction or just after, you will see generally elevated platelets as well as an elevated neutrophil count. Uh, one series reported lower basal body temperatures. Um, and in a small Korean series, um, during an acute episode, they actually put an NG tube down and found that um, Elevated gastric juice leukocytes above 10 per high power field at about three hours um, was a marker and about 15 of 16. This needs uh, further validation, but again, this might be something that if you're doing a challenge and you're not sure what you're seeing or they happen to be brought into the hospital and you're not sure what you're seeing at that time, that's something that could help there. But for most of these kids, they actually they never make it to the emergency room. They just sort of resolve at home, which is one of the remarkable things about this diagnosis. In terms of phenotypes, there well, they're very well may be two types of phenotypes, and this is um, from Ichiro Nomura, um, where in Japan they tend to see FPIs like we saw it in the 1960s and the 1970s, mainly in the neonate period, um, in, in cow milk-fed infants um, with bloody stools. 
whereas in in the U.S. and in most westernized countries, we're seeing slightly older babies, usually probably three to eight months of life, and we're seeing more of a vomiting phenotype than sort of this sort of chronic FPIs phenotype, which is really what this looks like if you match up these symptoms and, and read some of their articles compared to um, the Powell and the Grabowski series that came out of the, the late 60s and early 70s. Um, you know, this is a schematic. This isn't sort of a hard and fast phenotype. He's done what's called cluster analysis where they've look to see how the data aggregate themselves and they found that there are a couple of patterns that they see within their population. Um, it's hard to say what they're actually seeing. If this is really a different illness in a different culture in patients who might have different HLA uh, and, 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 and just differences in, 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 you know, based on race and ethnicity than we have in the United States or if this is a practice style because they're not catching this fast enough or they continue to give these babies more and more formula in the neonate period and they just provoke something else that we wouldn't see in the U.S. and that, and that remains to be seen. But um, he published this article in 2012 in, uh, in JSCI. It was a letter to the editor. Um, a little bit statistically complicated but just fascinating. It's a really cool way to look at, um, at, at data. I don't know if you guys have, have, have looked at that at all or are familiar with that article, but it, it, it actually really is fascinating. You need to take a look at it. Yep. This is a repeat. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> FPIs triggers. Um, again, the most common triggers that you're going to see are cow milk or soy, um, but this might be country specific and dietary practice specific. Certainly in the U.S., um, we see a lot of cow milk and a lot of cow milk and soy co FPIs. In the three large or semi-large series that have been done in the U.S., we've had reported co-FPIs rates of 23, 29, and 50%. However, in Israel, Australia, and Italy, there's been no report of co-FPIs. And again, this leads to a question, is this a dietary issue, is this a cultural issue, or is this a true phenotypic issue and something that, that's different in the U.S.? In terms of solid foods, rice seems to be the most common provoking thing, followed by oat. But again, you can see this to a multitude of grains and other solid foods, things you wouldn't expect, like chicken or turkey or, or, or other legumes, starchy vegetables, etc. Um, again, the solid food FPIs tends to be reported at around four to seven months as opposed to the liquid, which you see around one to three months. But again, that, that's just when you're weaning it in in the diet. Across um, these different series, um, again, you can see a variety. And some of these were limited. They only looked at certain foods, like this one in, in the U.S. only looked at milk and soy. This one in Israel only looked at milk. But when you look at a multitude of things, again, you can see um, milk and soy tend to be um, at the top. Rice, I would say milk, egg, soy, and rice. If, if you put a gun to my head and said what are the four most common triggers, that would be milk, milk, soy, um, oat, and rice. Um, and then you can see other things like peanuts, certain meats, corn, vegetables, um, you know, fish in the Italian series, that's a big cultural thing there. Fish is introduced very early in their diets. So again, you know, a lot that has to do with sort of weaning practices as opposed to what might be the true uh, top provoking foods. It's not uncommon to hear reports of kids having FPIs to multiple foods. Um, milk and soy is probably the most common, but there have been reports of multiple, multiple foods. Milk with wheat or rice or fish or banana, rice with other foods, um, multiple grains, um, solid liquid, multiple liquids. I think you can see every permutation. Um, in the CHOP cohort, which is really the largest sample that we have, um, they found that 70% of their cases were reacted to only one or two foods and 30% reacted to three or more foods. And of those, they found it was 29% reacted to both milk and soy and 41.6% to multiple grains. They had less than 5% that reacted to six or more foods, and it's, it's a burning question if this is a different syndrome, a different phenotype or something. Um, I guess you could call that more multiple food protein intolerance. Um, but at the larger centers in places like CHOP that have these huge cohorts and really have a reputation nationally for being the FPIs expert, we're probably more likely to see those cases um, presenting there. Um, and again, you know, the milk or soy comorbidity may or may not be just the U.S. thing that remains to be proven. Um, in terms of pathophysiology, I will say it's rare to get a, um, a biopsy. Um, <clears throat> but um, when you do, um, the endoscopic features uh, may be colitis, 
um, involvement of the ileum to varying degrees, mucosal friability, some hemorrhaging, uh, maybe some ulcerations in the colon and rectum, similar to ulcerative colitis, and focal erosive gastroenteritis, uh, gastritis and esophagitis. Even. Um, histologically, you can see crypt abscess, villus atrophy with flattened jejunum, um, high numbers of lymphocytes, and possibly IgM and IgA containing plasma cells. Um, this is coming from very, very small studies, so please take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, there is a, a, a a theorized role of TNF-alpha. Um, it's been shown at least peripheral blood mononuclear cells may proliferate with food stimulation and release TNF-alpha. Uh, and they think that this is triggered more by intact as opposed to processed proteins. Um, they've seen fecal TNF-alpha levels higher in infants with um, cow milk reactions. And there's some uh, thought that TNF-alpha and interferon gamma may synergize to help increase intestinal permeability. And if you think about what's happening when you're third spacing in your gut, basically you're just having massive water leak coming into, um, into the intestine and into the lumen and you know, you've got two routes to go. You can either go down the pipe or back up um, <clears throat> and, and this antagonism um, at, the, at the tight junctions really might be sort of where therapy should be triggering, uh, you know, possible ways to stop this. Um, they've seen TNF-alpha duodenal staining higher in FPIs um, and in infants with villus atrophy versus controls. It's one thing that they're looking at. Um, decreased TGF-beta-1 expression um, might also be an, another mechanism and there's sort of this, this imbalance of TGF, uh, of uh, sorry, TNF-alpha to TGF-beta, which really might uh, tinker with the permeability at the tight junctions. Um, <clears throat> this, you know, and there might be a role of T regulatory cells as well. Again, just very, very sparse data on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is sort of probably the best pictogram of what they think might be happening. You see this villus atrophy. You see this permeability here at the tight junction. And again, imbalance of TNF-alpha to TGF-beta, which may be antagonized by interferon gamma levels. Um, more, more research needs to be done on this, though. Other cells involved in this process, there might be some eosinophilia noted on some biopsies. Um, it's not very specific to FPIs. Um, there might be some leukocytosis, some neutrophils in the stools, and some reactive thrombocytosis. This reactive thrombocytosis is not from megakaryocytes or hemoconcentration. It's, it's a physiologic stress. It's from splenic release. So the management, and this is probably the, the, the most key part of, of the lecture. So what do you do for somebody we have identified that there might be FPIs? First thing to do is pull out the offending allergen, just like in IG-mediated food allergy. Avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. In the case of milk, generally these kids will tolerate hydrolyzed formula, but not all of them will. Um, I think if you were given a multiple choice test, um, elemental formula for milk or soy FPIs is the safest answer. Um, there's not a lot of literature substantiating big milk tolerance in FPIs. Um, not every milk allergic or milk uh, FPIs kid will be intolerant to soy, but you have to be very, very careful. It's probably safer to go to a hydrolyzer elemental formula and then challenge the soy to prove that you can have that in the diet or challenge the milk if it's a soy case. Um, in terms of avoiding other foods, I generally don't restrict other solid foods in the cases of milk or soy FPIs. Um, when there's a single grain that's been a trigger, um, I sometimes will bring the kids in to challenge. If it's rice, I'll challenge oat in the office. Um, it, it, it depends. It, a lot of it depends what they've had in the diet when they're presenting, uh, what the parent preferences are. Um, you know, a, a good strategy for the dietary management of these kids is to introduce fruits and vegetables first and not grains um, to the controlled challenges in the office. Again, that's not a, a wrong strategy. If you're a little bit more conservative and want to say one grain equals all grains, we're going to have you avoid these things. As long as you're having these kids come back into the office and you're giving them the opportunity to truly fail, um, I think that, that that's a fairly good strategy. Just restricting these foods for a number of years I think is really flawed and, and you know, a lot of these kids are not necessarily going to react. Um, a small percentage will. Um, in terms of, you know, what you can do for an acute reaction, um, this is not a illness that is treated well by epinephrine. Um, they need fluid replacement. Again, they're going into hypovolemic shock. Uh, you would do what you would do in any other situation in hypovolemic shock. You would give copious amounts of volume expanders, IV fluids. 
um, there's a couple of, of case reports in series that suggest that odansetron um, is, is helpful in shutting down the vomiting and, and stopping the volume loss. Um, some case reports also of using IV steroids as an adjunct therapy here, uh, but really it's, it's prompt fluid resuscitation that really um, gets you the most bang for your buck. Breastfeeding, um, exclusive breastfeeding has been seen as protective, and again, you onset at weaning. Very, very few case reports of, of transmission through breast milk. I think that this is probably more commonly perceived than it actually happens. Um, you got to be very, very careful here. Um, before, when I said that in, in dietary proctocolitis, that I will tell the mom to um, remove a single allergen from her diet in certain cases. Here, I, I virtually never tell them, unless there's evidence that the child is having failure to thrive and they're only breastfeeding. That's the only time that I'll really interfere with that. That's just, again, a good way to alienate yourself from the parent um, without a lot of evidence that you're actually doing um, any actual good for the child and, and certainly for the mom. Uh, if you think about the mechanism for how protein could pass from mom's diet um, through her stomach, her digestive processes, her secretory IgA, both in her stomach and, and during the lactation process, into the baby's mouth and undergoing, again, more digestion and secretory IgA to get into the bloodstream and be intact and cause a reaction. I think you're, you know, it's probably theoretically possible, but probably not very, very likely. Um, so just something to think about. Again, I think if the parent is, is breastfeeding, and has a baby with F pies, and, and you're pretty sure that nothing is being triggered through um, the breastfeeding, that there's no reason to stop it. Um, again, for caloric needs, some of these kids may need um, supplementation with the hypoallergenic formulas. Um, but again, you know, they're, and I guess you can make an argument that maybe the safest option is the hypoallergenic formula, but um, there might not be, that, and there's certainly no evidence that shows that that is safer in, in most cases than, than breastfeeding if there's sort of no, no preceding history that there's ever any you know, issue with, with past breastfeeding triggering a reaction. Performing a challenge in FPIs, this is very, very important. These kids need to be challenged. You need to re-challenge them to, um, to show that they're going to be tolerant again. Um, and actually, there's some data from an unpublished survey, something that we presented at the Academy meeting two years ago. A lot of times, the parents have problems finding a provider who would challenge them, so they just end up doing this at home, which is a little bit frightening. Um, it, it seemed like in our sample it was working out for the best, but again, it's just a lot of risk that you don't want parents to take. Um, there are protocols for this. It's a pretty easy procedure. Um, again, you need to be prepared and think ahead, but this really does benefit the family so much. Um, Unlike what we do in IG mediated food allergy where um, you know, we divide it into five or six different portions and you're going for almost 10 grams of, uh, of, of protein, this is a weight-based um, this is a weight-based uh, protocol, um, anywhere from 0 0.006 up to 0.3 grams of protein per kilogram. I usually split this into three equal portions fed uh, every 20 minutes over that first hour. Um, and then you watch for a couple hours to see what will happen. And it really can be as simple as that. You want to be prepared. Some centers will do this in a step-down unit or an ICU. Some centers will do this in an observation unit. Some centers will do this in a dedicated challenge facility. And some providers will do this in the office. Again, there's no right or wrong. It's what you're comfortable with. Um, some providers place an IV. Some, some have one ready to go. Um, you know, some have EMS on standby. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, you know, we've done a little bit of everything at, at Michigan. I generally do this in the clinic with an IV waiting, but not actually in the child. The rounds will be held in conference room B no, that's, on the that's just floor. Okay. okay. Continue. Go ahead. Um, I think in terms of the timing of when you can offer a challenge, this is variable. Again, not a lot of evidence to um, to guide this. I think the conservative answer would be 18 to 24 months past the last event, and the aggressive might be within six to eight months. Um, or, or just strictly by six to eight months if they present earlier milk after about 12 months of life. Um, <coughs> that, that all depends, and we'll, I'm going to show you a, the next slide. We'll talk about that. The long-term prognosis, why it's important to challenge, because most of these cases are outgrown. And when I counsel somebody you know, who comes in with f for the first time, I really can look them in the eye and say, this is a matter of when, not if. And that, that's very different than sort of your peanut or tree nut allergic family. Um, 
the milk and soy rates are different than solid foods. Soy will resolve before milk, will resolve before solid foods, although to some degree that's population dependent. Um, solid food resolution is, is far less studied. It looks like vegetables and oat tend to resolve before rice, but again, you're talking about small, small samples and what might have just been into that clinic as opposed to what you'd see at a population level. Those cases of FPIs with also a positive specific IgE to that food might be more protracted. But again, overall, very, very limited data on prevalence, national variability on some of these trends. What do we know from outside the U.S. and from within the U.S.? So in Korea, 63% of, of milk FPIs were tolerant by 10 months. 91.7% of soy FPIs were, were tolerant by 10 months. In Italy, about half. Um, we're, we're tolerant about 20 months post-reaction, almost 100% of this egg, soy, and rice. In Australia, slightly higher rates, but an older age. In the U.S., this has been a little bit all over the place. Um, the CHOP sees 35% by age 2, 70% by age 3, 80% by age 4, and there was no difference with solids and liquids. In Mount Sinai, by age 3, 63% of their milk, 25% of their soy, 66% of their oat, 40% of their rice. Um, that might be predicated on, you know, availability of challenge provider uh, sort of input to that. Um, actually, at all these centers in Israel, 50% of the uh, of the milk FPIs were tolerant by age one, 75% at 18 months, and 88.9% at age two years. So again, the point here is that the trend is that this does resolve for most individuals. There are going to certainly be some kids who who hold on to this, but that's fewer and far between. Um, but the varying rates uh, are, are different, different methodologies might produce these varying rates. So again, you got to look at sort of the size of the cohorts, when they decided to do the challenge as opposed to did they just sort of prospectively say, we're just going to do this in 12 months and see how many are um, actually tolerant or, or are they just going to say three years are going to bring them back. You know, again, you get a different story. Um, Quality of life in FPIs, and, and this is how we're going to end the talk. Um, outcome measures in FPIs are poorly established. Um, you know, most data in FPIs are actually poorly established, but but this in particular is something that that has been lacking. Um, we put together a pilot study of the feasibility of the food allergy quality of life parental burden in FPIs. And why do we pick this particular index? Well, we know that this is a caregiver index. And um, just like IG-mediated food allergy and non-IG-mediated food allergy, these are often small children. So it's the caregiver who's really facing a large burden of disease. But if you look at the items and the things that they ask about, difficulty in various aspects of life, um, it's related to food avoidance, which is exactly what you're doing in FPIs. And there's no reason why on face this shouldn't also, you know, potentially reflect the same themes. Um, it's a disease with the burden of vigilance, and living with that burden of vigilance might be associated with some difficulty. Uh, so we undertook a pilot study looking at the FAQLPV um, and trying to correlate that and validate that against a couple of other um, established measures that 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 have measured um, quality of life in chronic disease in the family. Uh, so we, we, we gave this against the PQL as well as the food allergy independence measure, which is an expectation of outcome measure that's been used to validate quality of life studies in Europe. Um, and we compared the FPIs burden in, in about 70 caregivers at a national FPIs conference to a nested sample of caregivers within our clinic that had peanut, tree nut, milk, and egg allergic children. And what we found for the index in the FPIs population is that its reliability was high. So this is this Kronbach Alpha is a statistic that sort of shows how closely correlated are our individual answers amongst people with the same disease. You want that to be high but not too high. Um, it also showed a very strong correlation um, with the PQL. Um, and, and a moderate correlation with the expectation of outcome. So again, that, that gives it some validation that it's, it's measuring somewhat of the same um, spectrum of illness. The individual domains correlated pretty well with the PQL, a little bit less so with the food allergy independence measure. Uh, a lot of this had to do with the, the independence measure really asking about death and dying, which is um, what we found out in FPIs is that's just not a a concept that's important to the parents. They, they generally don't think that their child is going to die, whereas in IgE-mediated food allergy, um, obviously that's a very uh, ready fear. Again, this is just the distribution of the items. Um, this in and of itself doesn't mean very much until you show it against a food allergy population. 
Uh, so the blue bars are the F pi's mean, and the red bars are the food allergy mean. And um, even with the naked eye, you can see um, a lower score means a better quality of life, and you can see a huge difference between the two populations. Food allergy has a, a much better quality of life uh, than the average F pi's uh, parent. These are huge mean significant differences, eclipsing even uh, a conservative difference of 0.5, showing where a significant difference may lie. Uh, we actually calculated the the, um, the index specific measure, which was 0.32, so almost a fourfold uh, eclipsing of uh, of that between the two illnesses. Um, and this is really interesting. You would think, you know, again, why are these illnesses that are really similar on a lot of levels, similar enough that, that the same quality of life index will work. Why is the burden so different? What are they feeling in FPIs that they're not feeling in IG-mediated food allergy? <clears throat> and some of the predictors that we found in a regression model, again, um, adjusting for the presence of all these other factors, um, you know, certainly the population has an effect. Um, allergic comorbidities has a worsening effect. Um, a belief of empowerment has some effect and age has an effect. Things that didn't have much of an effect, income, race, education level, insurance, having a diagnosis by an allergist, other food allergy in the family, <coughs> um, and, and, and overall advancing uh, interaction of age with itself. Um, again, what we saw was far worse quality of life associated with FPIs. Um, older age of diagnosis is associated with a better quality of life. And, and a better empowerment or self-efficacy score is associated with a better quality of life. Um, this is under revision right now at a journal. Um, we're pretty excited about this. This is the, the index study of this concept, um, which shows that, again, we need to do more for these parents. We now at least have an index that's valid to measure sort of what whatever trouble or dysfunction they may be having in their lives. We don't know what this means over time, but at least in a cross section we can say there's a significant burden associated with this food allergic disorder that's different than other food allergic disorders. Um, we need to sort of dig in and now figure out why some of the things that we speculate um, <coughs> just very few providers are aware of this and we, we have um, data that's being submitted as a work group report, a survey from the Academy done last year that showed that allergist familiarity was not great. There was an abstract uh, also submitted at the last meeting um, that showed that uh, general pediatric uh, familiarity with, with FPIs was also quite poor, so there might be some frustration from these parents that they can't get an accurate diagnosis. They don't feel like they can find somebody who knows what they're doing with this. That, that in and of itself might be um, reflective of why there's such a difference. Maybe the fact that there's no treatment that the, that the family has other than IV fluid, less knowledge, just sort of less awareness overall. So lots to be told on that story. Um, and I'm hoping that other groups will sort of take up the challenge and start to look at this disease and, and use this index to see sort of, you know, why we're seeing such a difference between these diseases. To me, that's fascinating, but uh, I'm wired a little bit differently than the average allergist, I know that, but uh, that's what makes me tick looking at things like that. So overall with FPIs, what do we need going forward? We need prospective cohorts. We need better prevalence and incidence data. We need better um, <coughs> better guidance on rechallenging, cross-reactivity, primary prevention, diagnostic testing, really lots of everything. Um, we need better assessment of quality of life and other outcomes, and we need these practice guidelines. I think that this will be a huge step forward, and these are nearing submission. This will have to go through a lengthy approval process because it was a work group issue through the academy, um, but we're hoping within the next couple of months we'll have you know a sizable document out that goes comprehensively through the steps everywhere from diet and nutrition to lifestyle to pathophysiology, really just sort of a very nice primer on this illness. Um, and not just from the U.S. perspective, but internationally. And this is one of the few documents that really does from, from you know, a, a U.S. document that takes an international perspective, which we thought was, was rather unique. So with that, I'll open this up to questions, and thank you very much. All right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenhut. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, Matt, I have uh, at least one question. This is Paul. Um, hey, Paul. <coughs> um, the, uh, um, you mentioned um, that you, when you do the challenge, you do um, um, you split the dose of the food into three equal portions and give it um, uh, over the first hour. Um, here we've traditionally done that, but we've also uh, we start early in the morning and then like at noon or one or whatever we give them another dose of food, just a single dose. 
then they're watched in the afternoon. Um, and part of that's from the from some guidelines that were put out, I think, as a supplement from um, Jackie a few years ago about doing food challenges um, in general and had all the information in the little supplement about food challenges. Um, do you do a second stage or you just rely on the first um, point and um, just watch them for two or three hours and then if they're fine, you send them off? Yeah, uh, we, we, we get reports that, you know, it... We, not everybody, but you know, oh, this is only going to happen on like the fifth or sixth exposure. I, I, we're a little bit stuck on what we can do. <coughs> I mean, <coughs> I think reimbursement for challenges is tough, anyways. And most insurers or third-party payers are only going to pay for that first one. You know, what do you do about subsequent ones? You know, protocols. I, I, it's it's tough. I, I don't think that there's a good solution there. I mean, again, I think we would need a better definition to justify further. Um, you know, doing a second day, a third day, a fourth day, doing sort of a second feeding in one day. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you could potentially um, choose to attack this, but, you know, I think right now we're stuck with sort of, you know, one feeding. Again, you know, we split it up. The recommendation is to split it up. Do some people do sort of one big feed? Do you think, would it really make a difference? Probably not, but, um, you know, I mean, we, we do graded things in IG mediated food allergy because you think that there's a threshold and you could catch something. Um, I, I mean, certainly that protocol could be adjusted a little bit. But. Straight in from the southeast. This is going to help create more storms. From your from your uh, protocol, then you basically, like we do here, you divide the, the initial yeah. food into three doses over the first hour, and then you watch them for two hours, three hours, four hours, or four, four to five. Okay, and then have you had any instance where if you've avoid, if you've watched them for say four hours, they've left and had had any response after that? Generally, no. A couple of times, and and those cases were a little bit more atypical challenges anyway. All right. Well, at this point, we're going to have to stop because our room is being. We have another conference right after this one that's not on online. At any rate, thank, thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Greenaut. Clearly, what you're doing is cutting edge, and we look forward uh, with bated breath for this practice parameter. I hope you can get it approved and, and published as quickly as possible, because I think it sounds like it's going to be a major advance in our treatment of these diseases. Yeah. Well, just let me clarify. That's going to be it's going to be a work group report and sort of a practice guideline through the academy, as opposed to the joint task force. Although, I'll talk to Anya Nowak is the other. Um, Senior author on this, and uh, I mean, we can we could try for the joint task force thing. I think it's, we probably missed the boat on that, and but but it's very rigorously done. It's all along the same quality. So yeah, we look forward to, to seeing. It. Anyway, thank you so much, and uh, right, thank you, Jeff. Everyone, we'll see you next uh, next time.